Welcome back for our second session on the Industrial Revolution. We're now going to take a look on the Industrial Revolution outside of Europe and see how it influenced the rest of the world, uh, mainly looking in three areas uh, with the United States, uh, Russia, and Latin America. And so to start off with, we're going to look at the United States. One of the biggest goals of the United States was that they wanted to avoid socialism. And uh, you can actually see that's still happening here in the U.S. today. Uh, if you look at the Republican race for Congress, and even partially in the Democratic race with some of the things Clinton's saying about Bernie Sanders, um, they, they vehemently fight against the ideas of socialism. And uh, they knock on Bernie Sanders and saying, hey, this is not an American thing. And uh, that's been a common thing in U.S. history. Because it's viewed as, as it's going to bring instability, it's going to lessen the uh, greatness that America is. And so instead, we push for the government to kind of loosely regulate things, really following um, Adams's views on capitalism and laissez-faire. The U.S. is also very accepting of immigrants, which uh, leads us to have a major labor surplus. Um, and that's something that we've consistently had, and that's what's something that's consistently allowed the U.S. economy to thrive. And uh, later on in this Industrial Revolution, we will pioneer the process of mass production. So we will not only have things being made in factories, but now we will mass produce things in factories, which um, allows things to be made much, much quicker, and allows things to be made uh, or fixed much quicker as well. And so uh, we have things like interchangeable parts that are made or created that allow for a quick assembly so that you don't have to assemble it all at the factory. Or if something breaks, you usually just change it and fix it up, especially with the large machines. This is a great thing. Um, but we also invent the assembly line. That's invented by Henry Ford uh, with his uh, Ford Motor Company. And that allows for a automobile to made, be made much, much faster, and that's what makes the car such a popular thing in the U.S., and why it becomes such a, a driving force of U.S. culture, because they became so cheap, and why it's not as much in Europe, because it happens later. And uh, with this, the U.S., because it gains so much wealth from this industrialization process, um, we developed a culture of consumption that we have to have it, have it, have it, have the newest thing, have the greatest thing. This partially comes from Ford, uh, but it's just all the other industries and how it's been advertised to us and, and, and things that we've just done all the way, all the time. And so it's all about buy it now, buy it now, have the newest and greatest thing. And so that really pushes and drives the Industrial Revolution here. Now, I don't have the social effects up here, but the social effects are similar to what we see in, in Britain where you have an upper class. Now, it's not a landed aristocracy, but you do have the upper wealthier class, upper families, um, the political families, and then below them you have the middle class, the rising class, starting to create some of the businesses, and then you have uh, the lower class, which is doing a lot of the hard labor, uh, especially in the mines in West Virginia and Pennsylvania where they're doing a lot of tough work, uh, and then in the factories in Chicago, um, Pittsburgh, and the major manufacturing centers even in New York and other regions like that. Um, that are that are doing these things, and they're living in very similar conditions to what we see in in Europe. Okay, now Russia, on the other hand, on the other side of Europe, very near um, to where the Industrial Revolution begins, but it is also a lot different. Um, the Tsar is viewed as as an absolute dictator or as an absolute monarch. Um, should say monarch instead of dictator, but. Um, he has control of everything, even in the economy. And the czars decide, well, maybe this Industrial Revolution thing isn't really, really for us right now. And so they take it up much later. And when they do, it's a really slow process. It's not very effective. They don't really industrialize very well. And they leave a lot of issues to um, fester and, and become major issues. Um, for example, uh, when the abolitionist movement ended, or, or was successful and ended slavery, uh, the Russians also later ended serfdom. However, it kind of ended, but didn't really end. And so what happens is, eventually these serfs are tied almost to the factories, into the land around the factories, just like they were before on the farms. And so 
things didn't really change. And those problems with those, that those people go through don't really change. Um, as well, um, the industrialization only really happens in major cities, cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. Um, and so it's not all the way across the country. Not everyone's filling this wealth. And I mean, it's a huge country kingdom to go through. I mean, remember, Russia goes all the way from Eastern Europe to the uh, Bering Sea. But they don't really set things up well. And so this leads to a lot of frustration in the middle classes and lower classes. And this is what, when we looked at Karl Marx, this is what Marx said would happen. The middle and upper class or lower classes would get fed up. They'd get sick of the government that is just supporting the rich and wealthy and not changing things. And will eventually revolt. They will fully revolt in 1917. Um, actually, 1915, sorry. In 1915, um, with the, when we have the full-blown revolution, but there are earlier um, renditions of it, or earlier, um, you could kind of see it coming. Uh, in 1908, there were some um, quarreling between the lower classes and the elites in government, and so that caused some problems, and uh, those continue to happen. They don't get fixed. And so World War One. Uh, along with the lack of reforms, will lead to a revolution in, in Russia, and that will be led by a guy named Vladimir Lenin, uh, and he will establish communism after forcefully, um, after leading the revolution, and then leading a second revolution within that revolution to set up a communist government, and um, this will then continue uh, until the end of the Cold War uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union um, in uh, the late 1880s, early 1990s. And then our last area we're going to look at is the industrialization in Latin America. And Latin America, if you remember, with, with their revolution process was, was very difficult. Um, the people were divided into different classes. The Creoles didn't want to mix with the lower classes that were mixed races, and especially the Indians. They wanted to keep their, their white heritage and and their European heritage, and stay separate, and stay in power, and these really didn't go away. They, they are still in power economically, and in the government-wise, and um, what will happen is, in Latin America, you have a lot of civil wars going on with who should be in power, and um, these people that are in power um, will look to their military leaders to, to maintain that power, and these people are called cadillos, but and sometimes they will protect that leader. Other times they will say, well, nope, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to kick you out and I'm going to make myself um, president or whatever it may be. And so there's a lot of instability there, which doesn't make it a good place to uh, try to have an industrial revolution. However, Europeans will see it as a possibility to invest in it, to make some money off of it and, and get some good out of it. And so they'll bring technology and loans and money and everything that you could need to set up the businesses. Um, and the Creoles who own most land will say, yeah, we'll do a little bit of that. But they really don't focus on it. Instead, they say, well, we're making plenty of money selling the natural resources from our land, whether it's mining the iron or silver or rubber or whatever the case may be that they are getting and sending to the Europeans or to the United States or wherever, and so they, they, they're happy with that, and they don't really fully industrialize, and so this just um, keeps that lower class low, because they don't have an opportunity to rise and make better wages, or, or, or rise up the ranks in a factory system, or anything like that, instead they're kept on those, uh, the lands, or the, the farmlands that they were kind of um, tied to already, uh, from the earlier systems of coerced labor. And so they stay impoverished, and uh, essentially this kind of becomes a new colonialism where the Europeans will kind of control the major businesses there and, and the economies there, and the Latin American countries don't have a ton of a say what's going on, but then that's also partially because the, the leaders of the country don't want to take up the opportunity for, um, for this. <clears throat> and so a couple things we'll see come of this are, are some revolutions, especially in Mexico. 
Um, I don't have it up here on this, but Mexico will go through a revolution in the early 1900s, which um, will be right before World War I, um, but they will have their own little revolution to try to take out some of the corruptness going on in their government and the instability, which will create some more instability. Um, and so if you're wondering why Mexico on our border is not maybe as secure, as stable as we are, even though they've been around a very long time, it's partially because of these cadillos they've had. They've had some uh, very tough military men who have done some great things for the country, but then also uh, really destabilized it. And we also didn't necessarily help the situation with our, um, our one, the Texas Revolution that happened, and then us fighting to gain Texas, and then also another third of Mexico's territory with uh, the southwestern United States. Um, that didn't help them either, but um, this is just kind of what uh, happens in Latin America. They don't industrialize as much as they could, and so they're left out there to be dependent still on the industrialized na nations. Now, the effects of all this are, is one, the biggest thing is we, we end up in a new age of man. We end up in what we call the Anthropocene Age, which is um, what we currently still are in today, which means this is the age of man. Literally means the age of man, which means we control the earth. We control our destiny now. We're not controlled by other things. Um, we have the power to uh, kind of do what we want, and we're getting to the point where we can control possibly um, with where science is going and things like that, possibly the environment or and... Uh, and a lot more things that can make life a heck of a lot easier here. <coughs> and what happens with this is we have a drastic rise in population because there is more food available. Um, eventually we'll get better health care out of this. We get um, jobs and we have things for people to do. And so we got plenty of that going on. And so you can see here on the chart that by 2025 we're going to be over 8 billion. And um, it's going to keep going up. And so uh, we have some issues today dealing with overpopulation in regions, but that begins here with the Industrial Revolution with a huge spike, as you can see. For most of history, we are steadily growing, 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 growing. Then we have a drop in that Black Death period, and then, boom, we go up. Um, and it's still skyrocketing today. Uh, in some areas, like in China and India, they're trying to lower their populations. And as you might have heard in China... Uh, which we'll talk about when we dive into them a little bit more. They went to a one-child policy, which they've now stopped, to try to cut off their population from skyrocketing out of control. <coughs> now, along with human population growing a lot, we also have a lot of uh, environmental issues that come with this because we're burning a lot of fossil fuels, and those aren't the best things, like coal power plants and things lead to acid rain for some reason, and that destroys the environment, and it's not good. And so we don't have the best things happening because of all this. And on top of all that, we, we cut down more trees and forests and everything else to be able to make our new products that we need or make our new homes. And so we're not filtering out the CO2 as much. And because we're not filtering out the CO2 as much, we have things like global warming going on today. And so it's just, it's, there are a lot of environmental issues that happen because of this, which aren't, aren't good, but that they're, they're part of the cost of the benefits that everything we're gaining from the Industrial Revolution. Um, as we stated uh, earlier with the uh, Industrial Revolution in Britain, goods are cheaper, there are more jobs, more things for people to do, uh, more people are living in cities, and today over 50% of the world population lives in cities or urban areas. And then... Uh, we have all those new technologies again, the steam engine, power loom, locomotive, spinning jenny. The cotton gin allows for the spinning jenny to really boom uh, because we get more cotton. It also leads to more slavery in the U.S. Uh, but this has also led to some greater inequalities, although it gives some people an avenue to rise up. Um, not everyone's able to do that, and that's not even the most common thing that happens. Most people just stay kind of where they're at. And so uh, in some areas it's led to greater inequalities with more people having a lot more wealth than others. And so the final thing is really a, a decision that you have to make as, as part of um, the Industrial Revolution. Was this, a, was this a good thing overall for us is, is kind of a question to think about is are, are the benefits that we get, the technologies, the urbanization pieces, the cheaper goods and, and more jobs for people and the higher population, is that better than the greater inequality that's kind of happened? 
the environmental damage and, and other issues that are that are happening because of the Industrial Revolution. And so I'm going to leave you off on that note.